Thank you. 
Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Pride Brunch here on Variant Roles. I am your, you know, host and master of ceremonies, Matthew Foreman. I can be found at Matthew W. Foreman on Twitter. This is a lovely little gathering of uh, members of the LGBTQI plus, plus community where we just kind of talk about various um, queer uh, issues and have a chat, get to know one another. And some of us drink mimosas. <laughs> um, so why don't we go around here? You know, I don't have the overlay up. Why don't we go around here and introduce ourselves? We will start with the teapot. No, that's a plate. That's a bowl next to me. Sam, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello. Hi. I am Sam, uh, Sam Tastic with three, I had to count the M's in my name, uh, with three M's. Uh, you can find me on Twitch and Twitter. I'm a variety streamer and I do the D and D's. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm very queer. The end. <laughs> the end. Uh, love it. And uh, Tesla, take it away. Uh, I'm Tesla from the RPG Lab. I stream six days a week, 7 p.m. GMT or BST, um, he, him. Um, yeah, I think the majority of my community is actually pretty much um, all LGBTQ+, which I'm pretty proud of, so. That is beautiful. And uh, Ink. Hi, my name is Ink. You can find me on Twitter at These Dead Pens. You can also find me in the Curse of Lords podcast on Twitter at Curse of Lords. I'm also here on Mondays playing Ravnica, technically legal, with many other fun folks. Um, I'm non-binary and use pronouns she, they. Either one of them really works. I'm just happy to be here. Goth and queer, let's go. Hey. I'm wearing rainbow today though, so I'm not that goth. Me, me too, me too. Uh, last but certainly not least, Michaela. Hi, I'm Michaela. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Michaela underscore V underscore Sims. Uh, I'm an old school gamer who is just getting back into 5e within the past year. And uh, my pronouns are she, her. That is awesome. So before I get started, as a reminder, all donations, bits, etc. go to Trans Lifeline this month, which is an organization, a 501c3, a kind of charity that helps trans people with a support and services. Uh, so every bit that you donate, all the bits, all the money goes to them to support uh, people in the mar marginalized trans community. Um, we have a whole slew of content this Pride Month. I know that later at 5 p.m., See, this is why I need the calendar up. I'm searching for it. 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern, no, Central, is um, Come On In, The Water's Queer. And then tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central, 12 noon Eastern is, uh, thank you, 6 p.m. EDT today. Later is going to be the Come On In, The Water's Queer, which is a salt marsh game uh, of all all played and ran by the members of the LGBTQI community. And then uh, on tomorrow, we have uh, uh, Goth Brunch, which uh, pretty much everyone there is gay too, it's fine. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, this whole month, everything we're doing is Pride Month and will help uh, to support Trans Lifeline. And uh, I don't know if there's something going on this Tuesday, but follow Variant Rules on Twitter to stay abreast and updated of all the Pride content. So, how about we start, um, I think since we're all kind of here from different, different channels, different things, different involvements, uh, let's, let, how about we kick off the thing and we talk about, um, how about we just kind of talk about uh, queer spaces and kind of talk about our own, our own backgrounds, where we come from, like, in the sense of like our, our channels here that we, we're all part of and various projects and that kind of thing. Um, who wants to start? I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> might as well. Um, yeah, it all started basically because I'm the DM of my community for the primary, for the primary when it started being developed. Um, it was mainly either you accept who I am or we just don't play. And it just built from that. It was literally just like, as long as you accept who I am, then I accept who you are, and we carry on forward. And anyone that didn't really help fit that sort of 
shall we say it was it was a non-issue shall we say for mo for the most part and anyone that it did become an issue with we didn't invite into the community anyway and it kind of then self-propagated from there because it was the people that felt comfortable with me felt comfortable in the community they then started bringing more people on board and then it just kind of, I kind of, I have to say I kind of fell into it <laughs> like I wasn't actively like looking for queer community it was just that I didn't see that there was any real difference like there wasn't like to me it didn't feel like there was much of a sort of a focus on the separate between the sort of the queer culture and the TTRP culture being just a little bit separate or at least I would say from the mainstream of so we say the cis straight white male type gamer um because I, I just never came across it um I've got I pretty much hopefully um I believe I've got quite a lot of different representations all across the spectrum which I find that there was a lot of people at the time when I started setting a lot of this up there wasn't that kind of just carte blanche acceptance support not making a big deal about it and just moving on and playing when I started a couple of years ago um and I think that's where the community kind of came from there it was all a bunch of people who hadn't found a way to find their expression or find a safe place to start doing that and since obviously there's been a, a hell of a lot more publicity and sort of more support through the community itself that it's now become much more of a forward thing and much more sort of vocalized thing but back in the day when I started my thing it was mainly just sort of like I'm looking for queer community or I'm a queer um, DM and it just kind of I think we just found each other chips in the night kind of thing that's lovely um, does anyone have a experience that contrasts that or is similar to well mine's a little different in the sense that for mm. most of the time that I was playing um, which was first edition 2E, that kind of thing, I had cis, white, hetero, male privilege. Um, in the 90s, we had a, um, a gay player in DM, who's still a good friend of mine, and has even been in my recent game we've been playing online. So we were always gay, queer, safe, but it was never for my benefit, or I was never actually part of it. So now that I'm playing, or I was at D&D Live, or those kinds of things, the amount of queer safe space that's available to, it seems like the community as a whole, is all over the place. And, and it's kind of awesome. I mean, it's just not something I would have expected 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I, yeah. When, as you were speaking, I kind of want to touch on that. You've really seen the hobby change over a long period of, of, of time, which is really Mm -hmm. an interesting perspective so you 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 have you do see a change from back in the day when you say you observed that kind of privilege to, to absolutely mm -hmm. what do you how do you think that uh, came about in the D, D space i wouldn't know because i stopped playing right before as third edition was coming out i switched over to world of darkness for a while and then i stopped playing pretty much completely around 2007 so just first getting the first book again last summer, about this time last year, was all about getting together our 1990s group together for like a one shot or something and, and play online. At least that was what was behind it. And then that was when I discovered everything from Critical Role to streamers to everything else going on. And it was mind blowing. So you guys have all come up that are coming up now in something that was totally unlike anything that we had before. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah, I really, th I really think it is too. And um, I think one of the reasons why I want to talk about like our own spaces and project is because I'll, I'll like tabletop RPGs are blowing up in a huge way. Like it's, they're growing exponentially and that gives us a real golden opportunity to make sure that the spaces that we are creating in our own time are, are safe and, and inclusive. So I think that's that's at least how I approach the topic of queer spaces. But anyone is welcome to talk about whatever kind of queer space they, they want, of course. Um, I have kind of a contrasting experience uh, where I was turned off from just TTRPGs in general because 
well, for about like five years, because in college, um, I was like, I want to play the D&Ds. And it was a bunch of cishet white guys who were like, oh, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. You're doing this wrong. You're playing a tiefling. Uh, uh. Because tieflings weren't cool, apparently. Um, they were too gay. Um, <laughs> but uh, it wasn't until last year that I was like, I'm going to play the D&Ds again. Um, and I got on roll 20. And then it wasn't really, I didn't find like a queer space. And then you know, my characters are usually queer. Uh, that's kind of how I roll. Um, <laughs> and, uh, like, I, I kind of, I guess I didn't war warn anyone. I didn't know I had to warn anyone. People were like, whoa, 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 you've, like, she's a lesbian? And I'm like, well, no, but kind of. Um, so honestly, it wasn't until I stumbled into variant roles that, uh, there was like a safe queer space that I had. So thanks guys. <laughs> Y'all. Uh, yeah, I have feelings, it's fine. Well, we didn't have a lot of female gamers, at least around where I was at the time. Um, in the nineties, actually starting in college, we almost always had at least one female gamer with, with us. And then with that group that I mentioned with, um, the, the gay player and DM, we had two women. I played a lot of female characters then, more so than most guys would have. But, and that gave me some kind of, um, people would say, you know, why are you playing a chick? And at the time, most guys who played female characters kind of played one of two archetypes. It was either, you know, the slut or the bitch. So that the fact that I was doing that kind of, I guess I got called a few names here and there, but um, we never saw the kind of um, isolation, both with women or queer players that specifically in that way that we saw that you did, which is kind of sad. Yeah, a lot of people's experiences are differently, but we all, I think we all know here that in the larger community there for a long time, there was decades of issues with that, that kind of, for let's just shorthand it neck beard isms that you know just haunted this community and just the kind of male aggression and that kind of thing that um really shot a lot of people turned a lot of people off from the hobby well the irony was they were usually the ones getting picked on by everyone else yeah so they turned around and did it to, did it to the people that they could which is not a great look <laughs> I don't know. I didn't talk about my experience in D&D, so I guess I'll do that now. Yeah. So I originally didn't start in D&D. I started in Pathfinder, which is kind of like for people that have played like 3.5, 3.75, but like blown up. So my first character was pretty much me, but with less anxiety and like a lot more male mannerisms. I was introduced to people that I don't really talk to anymore that's another bag of worms, but they were all queer people themselves. They were pan or gender non-conforming or bi. So I got relatively lucky in that aspect that I had people that did not fit within the typical boundaries of who was like supposed to, supposed to be playing t uh, tabletop games. I had two friends, Alyssa and Sam, that I played with. So I wasn't the only girl in the group for a while. But there came into a lot of issues when I was like, okay, so I'm ace and queer, and everyone's like, oh, you're basically playing a straight character then, which is usually how it falls into, like, especially when you play someone of, like, the opposite gender or not your gender, you kind of become that, like, you're just playing, like, a heteronormative person because you're fitting within that, like, boundary. Um, after a while, I stop talking to those people but I moved into my school that had a game club so I did my best to kind of make that like a queer tabletop space because for a while all they really played was like normal board games like Monopoly and stuff so I pretty much was like hey I want to play Dungeons and Dragons because I know for a lot of kids this is like the only times they're going to get to play that because their parents are stuck in the 80s satanic panic situation or stuck in the aspect where their parents are going to be like I'm not going to pay 50 dollars for this 
So we kind of did that. I opened it up to a lot of people to be like queer at the table, be trans at the table. We went to a convention and I pretty much was like, hey, let's be gay and have pronoun stickers because the convention that we went to was really cool like that. And as it kind of moved forward, I pretty much was like, hey, this is how this is gonna be. If you can't be accepting of this, then you don't need to be in the club. So you can just leave. I'm not gonna tell you to leave, but you don't necessarily have to be a dick at the table every time someone wants to say that like something's different. And now that I've gotten out of that, I have since graduated from that school, but I'm now playing characters that are like canonically non-binary and gender fluid and not stereotypically like masculine or feminine in their mannerisms, which I find has been really lucky, but I've still kind of faced that wall of like, oh, you're a girl and you're Asian and tabletop games so you don't have like the right to play because you haven't had to go through like the struggle of being alienated when we first started playing like in the 80s and I'm like I get that I'm younger than you but also why why do I have to struggle to enjoy this game I don't know why anybody from like our time period would want to inflict that on anyone else just to enjoy it it makes absolute no sense it's it's effectively um, punishing someone for not having to have been around at a certain time. It, it's yeah. it's stupid. Yeah. They're yeah. Like, yeah. They're like, you can't play D&D because you didn't grow up having to like make stuff in your basement. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I wasn't born in the 80s. What do you want me to tell you that my mom didn't think that that was an important idea? We like, were born, some what? of us were born in the 70s. Like, <laughs> so yeah, so get like, your decades straight. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Like, you didn't live through all of the issues with it, with tabletop games. And I'm like, yeah, and you did. So why are you making this happen again in 2019? Right. right. Yeah. Gate- gatekeeping is always a, is an issue everywhere you go. But um, yeah. luckily we have wonderful spaces like Variant Roles to where we can come here, be gay, do crime, be, you know, or just be queer, do crime, you know? <laughs> um, I will just talk briefly about my own little uh, little journey here. And um, so I started playing fifth edition a little, actually over, only a little over a year ago. It might be technically two years now off stream. And then as a stream game, almost exactly one year ago, um, one year ago last week. And um, I am... I, at the time we launched Dice Priority, I'm, I was the only member of the LGBTQI plus community. It's me and four white straight people. <laughs> Not only four white straight people, but two couples. <laughs> so uh, that is Dice Priority. That is Ghost of the Machine. Uh, but they are, they are terrific. They are terrific and lovely, lovely people to play with in DM. And uh, Ghost of the Machine gets pretty queer a lot of the times. And they just, you know, they roll with it. They're, they're very accepting and loving. Uh, We've since, you know, expanded our doors to invite on members of the trans community. Uh, We've also included some uh, diversity from uh, one of our uh, show has a couple people of color in it. And uh, we've invited other queer people on onto the channel. So that's been that's been great. Uh, I will say uh, something that Sam said, kind of want to piggyback off of about the tiefling thing. And like playing a lesbian or uh, and what have you. I remember years ago, this is years ago before Dice Priory. I'm playing a Goliath. At the time, it was fourth edition, so it was a warden. <laughs> and he's now a druid, a uh, 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 druid barbarian. And um, I was playing a warden, and I'm like set to like inherit a lordship or a kingdom or something. And uh, like romance basically came up, and I was like, "Well, I'm like he's gay. I've got gay." And the whole table stopped, and they all know I'm gay. I've been out since I was like 17, and the whole table and my DM at the time goes, "What? I've got gay?" I'm like. What? Of course, like, of course he's gay. <laughs> like, why wouldn't he be? <laughs> like, I'm gay. Like, all my characters are gay by default. And I remember that statement at the time really, like, made everyone go, oh, right, that makes sense. Of course your characters are, like, gay by default. I'm like, yeah, any male character I play is going to be gay by default. Um, that was actually, that was a years ago. That was actually uh, someone I still play with now. And what a journey it has been. <laughs> Uh, but it, it reminds me of this thing of it's like you have this fantasy 
world that you can play out, all these wonderful choices and characters to choose from. But there's this assumption by so many that, you know, it's all going to be normative anyway, because that's their own experiences. And um, yeah, that, that, was, that was always such a funny moment where like I had to justify my sexuality. I had come out, <laughs> I had come out like seven years prior to that moment, you know, and they all knew it. And then I like had to come out again to them in the tabletop space. It was, that's kind of how it was, you know, I was like, folks, like, like, since we're getting here, my, my character's definitely gay, like, he likes to smash, <laughs> like, what is this? <laughs> so there, there was this dynamic of, like, having to come out twice, and that, that was, that was, um, that was, uh, unfortunate, but here we are. <laughs> You touched on a good point, and we're also seeing it with with um, race and people of color and, and that kind of thing. And that's a lot of um, the hobby is done from the point of view of whoever is currently making it. And if for the longest time that's been cis white hetero males, then it, it's primarily going to be Western culture. It's primarily going to be white. It's primarily going to be straight. And and no one has any reason to have that assumption challenged. And the only thing that I ever had similar to it that kind of showed me something was way back, uh, I guess it would have been around 2000 when I was running a White Wolf game. I, I had it set in, in Baltimore and someone had messaged me online that a lot of your NPCs are white. And I had a dialogue with him and he turned out to be a student at, at one of the dominant black colleges in, in Baltimore. And they invited me up to guest DM a game. And here I am, whatever, 29, I think, white guy just in this all black area with this whole troop of, of these players. And it completely blew my mind. It was from a cultural standpoint, from how they interacted with the game to, to everything. It, it kind of changed, it flipped the switch in me with making sure that as I started doing more NPCs or, or storylines, even if it was just for my own game, that I brought more of that back into it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and even going beyond NPCs, like as the channel of our Dice Priority, when we started, when I wanted to start my second show, I was very adamant about getting people of color to play with and even hopefully in the future give them an opportunity to dm on the on the on the channel or or just support them on their own channels if they have if they have them um yeah diversity of all kinds is super super important and it, it opens up your eyes to whole experiences because i have two um players they self-describe themselves as biracial um and their characters are both biracial so they, they're exploring some things there and I, one of them plays a tiefling. I, I've known this, I've known him for years. Um, and I, I had gotten into the habit of, of describing infernal to mean evil and bad. And he, a crow at his plague, a tiefling. And so there was this really, in like the first couple of sessions, the guard kept saying infernal to describe evil. And then <laughs> the players would all, the players, the players had this in-game dialogue. They're like, we look at Zane. And then like, we look back at Gavin. I was like, okay, okay, I've got to change my dialogue here. I've got to, I've got to flip the switch here because this is, this is not, this is not great. <laughs> this is not terrific, and um, it ended up being a, a good, a good punchline for all of us. But um, it just goes to show you that bringing in perspectives and bringing and diversifying your table can can give give you give give you a better perspective and a better vision field of vision. Well, and in my case, it brought in the concept of gentrification as being something mm. that was affecting vampires and things. It never would have occurred to me as, you know, white suburban person. So if that can happen there, that can happen with race and culture and LGBT. And you can kind of, you can really make your game elevate it because you now are getting a, a second level of complexity that you never would have considered before. Yeah. So another thing I want to touch on, and kind of uh, kind of a subtopic, is what do you think it is about tieflings that are so queer alluring? So like, because Sam brought it up, and like it just tieflings are, aren't they? They are the queer icon, tieflings and drows and orcs. But like, what what it is? What is it about those 
kind of off or monstrous races do do we think that that appeal is so appealing to the community? I remember the first time I cracked open the player's handbook, uh, the first time I was going to play, and you know, flipping through, and I was like, elf, cool, half elf, neat. And like, just, you know, the base races. And then you get to tiefling at the end who gets like half a page. And you're like, even then it's like, they're, they fight their infertile nature and they're evil. And I was like, them, I want them. And also she's purple. And my DM was like, it says that you can only be like shades of red. And I'm like, no, she's purple. Like, like um, and it's, I don't know. There's something about, I guess, at least in that context for me, it was like, considered the other so I felt more comfortable with it than like male human fighter um I was like I'm gonna be a tiefling sorcerer or whatever um I don't know there's just something I think it I think for me at least it's like the other aspect of them um and also they're they're really hot I think it's mainly the idea that like tieflings are very visibly different and for a lot of queer people it's very important to be visible in a space so that other people can like see you and recognize you as someone that they can then trust in that space and it's at least for me when I first like played I've played one tiefling and god she is stupid but I love her I think it's mainly because they have to fight against that external hatred that a lot of people have associated with them because a lot of other races if they come across tieflings they're like uh not not normal not we not nice not typical and that's usually like the gay queer experience where you're usually seen as like the other the weird the not typical of a lot of at least heteronormative societies so your personal experience kind of aligns with the canonical typical association so any kind of interaction you have is I guess a very affirming experience with your queer experience because your struggle then feels valid and recognized in a way that doesn't permeate just in reality but also in like a fantasy reality Tesla we haven't heard from you in a minute uh, I have been kind of like discussing my slightly more in-depth thing in chat. Um, essentially, because I come from a literature background, this all comes from me, from my idea, it comes from sort of the Orientalism, the other post-colonialism, that kind of stuff. And if you go dig a deep into the actual literature, these monstrous races are only called that because they're not identified as the human counterpart to it. Elves have been almost kind of like culturally shoved into that same sort of archetype as well as dwarves and most of the common um, humanoid uh, races they've all kind of been shoved into some of the normative and the other races aren't really the other it's only because we see them as the other based off of the materials and I believe that that basically is why the cult the lgbt culture plus also under any underrepresented culture goes for those is because engendered into the text itself is that other identity into the text itself and usually those cultures are also given far more exotic sort of behaviors and i mean there's the um far traveler background and if you think of that, essentially that covers everything no one understands. And as such, that's why probably why the LGBT community plus goes for those films is for the act of identification, because you identify with the other, um, and also the representation itself and allowing the, because of the other spectrum, shall we say, there's a vast variety of different archetypes and different, even sort of body type representations as well, which is also a key factor into that sort of thing. So height, weight, uh, weight, weight, uh, gender, identity, color, all that sort of stuff is all lobbed in there. And I feel like that's probably where we go for it is because almost it's almost like in the writing itself, it's kind of primed. Hmm. Do you find, see, 
See, when I watched RPG Labs, I saw you play a gnome. <laughs> so do you find yourself uh, Yeah, those? the gnomes themselves, that would be the desert gnome, which is actually, I believe, very dark spell because they're in the desert. Most all my races are cult, are sort of appropriate genetic sort of wise. So that all the sort of the desert races, we've got dark skinned elves, like um, brown to sort of almost like black skinned elves. <laughs> Um, same sort of thing with gnomes and so I'll try to include more racial diversity and skin tone diversity and such within some of the already established stuff with my own homebrew because it doesn't make sense that they're all the same skin tone. Right. But do you it's find do you when you play, do you find yourself drawn to those kind of races or is it different is it a different experience for you? For me, because I've homebrewed my entire universe, it's what works with the current storyline. It what what fits that i'm not trying to shove in any sort of agenda or any sort of cultural stereotype that i feel like might be appropriate it's more sort of like they're in this region they're doing this thing pre-established are these surrounding factors if it so happens that this is in there or that so when it's an inset for me it's more of an incidental thing it's part of the story because my groups are so the sort of the queer aspect is so it becomes so normal normalized in our groups that it doesn't become something that ends up being something I try to put it in there. It's just generally in there and hopefully there's enough of it, but there's always that fear of, am I doing enough? As the sort of, as the GM, you've all, because, because like I said, I've got quite a huge spectrum of players in the community. I'm always conscious that, am I representing everyone fairly? equally am i bringing in the right tones and such and things like that and obviously it's part of the dialogue with your players and your community to get those ideas but even if you think you're doing the right thing sometimes you're not <laughs> so it's it's always best just to get i get the ideas from my players first and then try to work them in just because they're the ones that are going to find it appropriate or not. They're the ones that are going to want to seek that representation or that avenue to explore their character. And I'm there to hopefully facilitate it. <laughs> but yeah, I've not found any difficulty in, shall we say, including any sort of diversity in it, mainly because that was my idea from designing the world in the first place. I mean, none of the normal humanoid races that you get existed in the beginning shall we say in my world it was all the animalistic races all of those sort of the lizard folk and the kenku and stuff like that they all came first and then as the colonialism aspect of it the elves the humans and all that sort of stuff then arrived in this realm and so that in built into that there is the sort of the already turned on its head imbalance where you've not where the kenku and the tabaxi are the majority people where the humans and the elves and stuff have had to kind of fit in where they've been allowed, shall we say, or conquered. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I've tried consciously tried to make an effort to rewrite, shall we say, the, con the conscious bias in the text itself to try to mitigate, shall we say, some of the issues. I ramble, I apologize. <laughs> I will shush now. Michaela, you played at a time before there were such a thing as tieflings. And... Uh, right. I remember tieflings as being like a kind of, I wouldn't say a throwaway, but they were just part of Planescape. They, they weren't a, a primary race. Um, it was just elves and halflings and dwarves and, and gnomes. Um, and every once in a while, someone would want to try to play something weird or different, but it, there necessarily wasn't a role or, you know, a write-up for it. But yeah, no, no tieflings, no dragonborn. The closest we had to dragonborn were the draconians and dragonlance. And that was it. So there was never that, that kind of other race that people would have gravitated to if they were in that because for a lot of the people who were playing they were already marginalized even if they were white and and male
I will say that my first character in fifth edition was a tiefling. <laughs> uh, I started playing in third edition and I, Lord knows, I don't even remember what my first character was, but I'm truly, they were truly terrible. And um, the, the fifth edition, my first character was a tiefling. My second character <laughs> was a furbalk. <laughs> so, um, and a far traveler background. So I think there's certainly something to be said the way these mechanics and how they're juxtaposed to other parts of the system uh, appeal to the community at large. Because tieflings are like part, of, you know, we have one of our sub our topics here, queer culture. And like, as much as it is a meme, like it's true to, it's true to say that like our, our experiences, our perspectives and what we're drawn to as a, an amorphous blob of a community, there are some commonalities. And I feel like tieflings are such a, such a part of queer cultures. Twe tieflings for bogs and drow <laughs> and dragonborn. <laughs> yeah, drow were, were kind of that way, and then dritz came along. Yeah. And then everyone wanted to be the single drow that escaped. And of course, things have been rewritten quite a bit since then, so that it doesn't need to be um, so much of an oddity. But back then, yeah, it was everyone wanted to be the, the one odd out. Yeah, I'm going to be a drow who escaped from the matriarchy, and I have a, what is it, a panther as a pet? Yep, and <laughs> double scimitars. Yep, <laughs> this is my original character concept. <laughs> now, one thing that's that's strange, um, that I'm surprised I haven't seen more adopted with it, was that originally elves, they've always kind of had the androgynous kind of vibe going with them. Um, but now with 5th edition kind of really saying that some can be completely gender fluid, uh, I haven't seen I haven't seen anyone that I know of playing that yet. I'm sure it's done, but that really has a lot more way of um, that could be pretty meaty, I think. I'm actually playing a like gender fluid elf in the Curse of Lords podcast. Thorin is a uh, Corellan. I don't know if I don't know if it's Corellan or Corellan, but because of the expansion in the Mordecai and Tome of Foes. There is an expansion for elves that are blessed by Corellin to um, change their gender or their well, like appearance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I figured that would be a very interesting thing to play with. I also paired that with the fact that my elf is also an Eladrin. So there's like that aspect of fluidity, not just in gender being the only important thing, but it just being like an addition to something else about them. Yeah, and uh, Jeremy Crawford in one of the video interviews they did with him had said that for that trait that shows up in the trial, it's completely um, subversive. That for a society that is so matriarchal, that someone who could switch back and forth and effectively move up and down in class from it um, and is blessed by the god that they have more or less um, believe has shunned them, completely throws throws disorder into the equation it's it's meaty i mean it could be fun but it could also be stereotyped into something where it's just like i'm going from um guy one day to super sexy elf for the next and i'm going to use it for seduction purposes or something it, it could go really bad or it could be really cool for um you know kind of inhabiting something that's it's alien even for someone who's trans. Um, yeah, kind of continue this thread and open it up to a different kind of thing. So one of our little topics, uh, using tabletop RPGs to explore sexuality and gender. Um, I will just kick this off and saying that like, I have, uh, I, and I talked about this last time I was on Pride Brunch last week, uh, like tabletop RPGs to explore that has been very validating and very powerful for me. Um, there, you know, my Twitter is all about me, how, how, how gay and horny on main I am. And that's, that's all for a good laugh. But the reason why I chose to make my Twitter consciously about my sexuality is because, and my, and my expression is because it, I have played this hobby for 17 years, you know? Uh, and it's in my 17th year where I finally feel like I can be gay at the table. And that's just a pretty pri pri privileged guy. Maybe that's more, it says more about my personality and my own journey than, than a larger thing, but it's, it's been a long road to like, 
want like I want romance at the table and I was not part of spaces or communities that wanted that at the table for a long time I want to be gay at the table and <laughs> the first time I was gay at the table I got the big question mark uh not great and um you know if finally in year 17 of playing this dang, dang game through all of its iterations um I can explore my sexuality uh which is <laughs> It certainly has a couple of question marks next to it. As Michaela Teasley, uh, she said, you know, you've got to drop at least one of those question marks. And I said, I'd be happy if it doesn't grow with one more. Because <laughs> I, I do identify as a gay man, but I also, I my sexuality is forever changing as I get older, apparently. So here we are. But uh, yeah, let's let's talk about that kind of like exploring uh, gender, sexuality, and expression through through the tabletop space. I so desperately want to do that and I am so desperately terrified to do that um mostly because just like I I didn't come out as non-binary until like six months ago maybe um and even then like I'm a demi girl and a lot of people would tell you that I don't exist um <laughs> and um I don't know it's just like I there's the like getting into being a demigirl is like a whole thing but like there's the that nebulous space that you're always trying to figure out you're like who am what am I hello who am I today what's going on um and I've wanted to explore that and like explore the spaces in between but I'm terrified to do that like with people and I just with people being like that's not real that doesn't exist I don't know that's just a thing but I want to do it so bad <laughs> that also brings up like the argument of when you bring yourself to the table are you representing people in the correct way because especially if you're someone like Sam where they've told you that you don't exist or your identity isn't a valid thing and I know this happens a lot with like pan people and bi people and ace people and like non-binary people that use like uh, usually singular gendered pronouns. You get told that you don't exist. And it's that where you should explore it because then you get to challenge people's perceptions of what your gender can be and how other people identify in a way that's safe and non-threatening and in a way where it doesn't feel confrontational, where you're not like yelling at your friends, like, please examine your bias, understand that I exist and this is a real thing. Because that's the last thing you wanna do is present them with who you are or something that you're talking about and then make them feel like you're trying to shove it down their throat, so to speak. So in, in that case, it's basically, you're trying to be somewhat subversive until you can normalize it. I think, I mean. Do you want to expand, like, do you have an example, do you have an experience you can speak to, or do you want to expand on that? Well, in, I kind of already talked about, you know, in, in my case, where it was just playing female characters mm. um, or being online, but from what I'm hearing from Inc., there's that perception that when you're completely different, you don't want to put too much of yourself in front of people because you don't want that to be um, an issue while you're trying to play. And yet you want them to see the value of someone who is you. So if your character is ad adapting personal traits, whether it's gay or non-binary or trans or, or what have you, then if you just start being subversive about it, where you just start introducing the little bits and pieces. They've already been growing accustomed to your character. And sometimes these people, you only know them from the game. They're not part of your normal life. So if you're just introducing the bits and pieces as you go, as it's necessary for the game, that eventually it'll normalize to them that that's just how they see the character, which is all anyone ever wants anyway. It's all they ever want for themselves. So now when you do start bringing more of yourself into it, you're not challenging them. You're not shoving anything down their throat. 
and you're not putting them in a situation where this is all coming from left field. So it's that, um, it's that line that you walk from where we were discussing the perception is, is, is whatever you are in your case, Matt, it was the straight players and why they didn't, ex uh, it didn't click for them right off that you were playing a K character. It's only when you start bringing in the, the bits and pieces or sometimes eventually hitting them over the head that it rings true. And then at that point, it's normal. And then it's okay. At least that's the hope. I think it really speaks to like how as, as, as people in this community, we have to make ourselves very small to accommodate others. And that can be very frustrating, I think. Like we really, I mean, I remember I was terrified, terrified to do romance at the table. Like I, for one, I have nothing but straight men to romance, so whatever. <laughs> but I have to give it up to my my buddy Ty. He and I, our characters are kind of shipped in Dragon Heisters, and there, I mean, like he did not bat an eye. Like it, like we did, like I I started flirting with him. He he sent it right back, and our characters were shipped quicker than than I don't know. <laughs> um, but there was still it was still like the first time of me doing that in that way and we we really do have to make ourselves so so small not to spook the spook the the cis hats <laughs> have any of you had experiences with um players or dms um who are trying to play a character that is more like you, even when they're not. So like that's like a straight player trying to play gay and not come off as being, um, you know, a stereotype. I have a, a player right now who's who's doing his best to try to play a female non-binary. Non and sometimes I'm having to give him some tips, at least from my experience, but that's still not a non-binary experience. So has that kind of come up for any of you? I mean, I've had players subvert who they're playing. Like I had um, someone, I forget who it is. It was one of my players. He was a male and he was playing as a female. And he said it felt very odd to play someone of a different presentation because, you know, it's not a typical thing for you, especially when you're not used to presenting in a manner like that. And I essentially told him that you'll get, if you want to play this, you have to understand that sometimes you're going to mess up. That's not a problem. It's good to make mistakes because then you learn from that. And the importance is to understand why you're doing it and the value behind doing that and not just do it because you want to be diverse. Like you do it because you want to make it more welcoming and a very open space and not just because you want to earn diversity points or like check off boxes or be or like be a good person when you do it in public you want to do it because you want to do it not for some appearance sort of thing no that's a good point tesla we haven't heard from you in a minute um got nothing to contribute um i've i've got um active uh gay male relationship in month sunday's campaign i've got a actively promiscuous um by bard um which is interesting because any character i throw that way um could but it's a it's a bard <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, bars generally um not gonna go any further than that um i've got an ace character on my friday campaign so but apart from myself i don't have i've never because i've always been the gm never the player i've always tried to be as accommodating with whoever's at my table and try to give them what representation they want and is is there an npc that you found difficult to embody for whatever reason along those lines because i i know as a gm i've i've embodied some characters i think that are very i think yeah i think um personally i because i don't have the personal experience with trans and non-binary um until i can kind of confidently say that i can portray 
those um, with delicacy and a little and sort of nuance so that it's not just kind of it's there for the sake of being there or I'm doing something for the sake of whatever. Once I'm confident in being able to represent that without kind of that slight self-doubt, then I'll put them in. But because I still don't have that kind of experience, but like with the rest, I'm pretty, I've got quite a decent amount of experience in and I've got quite a large community base to draw from, but I personally just haven't included them yet, shall we say. Um, but that's just down to not feeling confident enough to represent. <laughs> Well, there you go. That that itself is an experience to to speak to not being, not feeling confident. I know I have had, I think, the most prominent uh, non-binary NPC that I embodied, and it was just as I was writing the character, I just didn't feel like they, they belong. Like I didn't feel like they would have. It just felt they felt they read as I wrote them. They felt and reminded me of so many of my non-binary friends. And I was like, well, this character is non-binary and I'm gonna have to embody them. And they also, as I wrote from them, I, I drew a lot of experience from one of the, my friends who has Asperger's syndrome and is on the, the well, depending on who you, who you read, uh, is on the spectrum. Uh, um, and that, that character was a, a tribute to one of my friends who I'd known for many years who had helped me uh, kind of form, form my identity. And uh, that stepping into their skin was, was interesting and it was very challenging. But uh, that NPC became very beloved, which was nice. <laughs> and uh, the, my players enjoyed them. So, but I, I think it's good to challenge oneself, but it, it, I, I also feel like if you do feel, if I felt that, like if I felt very unconfident, I, I, would, I wouldn't try it, would not try it. Uh, a strange thing about the trans experience is that in most of our games, we're dealing with um, magic and other things that pretty much can make it a non-issue. And this is assuming you're sticking to it to a more binary representation of trans. Um, so in those sorts of situations, you can already effectively morph. And if you're already playing in a society that doesn't care about gay or, or if someone is trans, then most of the challenges and situations that we run into that are difficult in real life they just wouldn't exist in the games. It, there, there's nothing that would really differentiate a trans uh, character, whether there's surgeries or not, um, from a non-trans character. Yeah, yeah. I, I've said I said that much when I was when I was writing and developing Ghost of the Machine because the people were asking about like you know is like is like there like do you have to inherit wealth through your male line yada yada yada. And I was like I was like isn't the idea of like of, of 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 gender doesn't it in our the way we conceive of it pretty silly when like alter self is a second level spell and, and like you know what i mean not that not that the entire your gender expression is defined by your body but just all the all the magics and all the things that can allow people to really express themselves in a variety of ways uh, our own understanding especially cis cis and cis people's understanding of gender seems seems pretty Pretty non congruent with a with a, a a setting that's filled with magic and enriched like that, you know. It's it's yeah. That's a mood. <laughs> yeah, as a as a DM for like my homebrew stuff, I just it didn't even occur to me to make like homophobia or transphobia a thing. I was just like, oh, those are that important NPC, they gay, they cute, they're so cute, I love them. Um, but for that particular um, group that I was running this one shot for, which was a lot of cishet guys, um, they got real weirded out when the, t the tiefling lady kissed the other hot barbarian lady, just like casually, because they were at work. Uh, <laughs> like, and everyone's like, whoa, 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 they're gay? And I'm like, yeah, is that a problem? Like, because you can leave. Um, they did not leave uh <laughs> but um so that that's like a weird thing um I just think normalizing it at the table as a DM I'm just like it's a non-issue for me it's up to the players if they want to 
play in that universe. Um, but for me personally, I've always wanted to do like romance at the table, um, like uh, woman love woman stuff. But before I stopped playing, I literally have had DMs force or try to force my characters into het relationships. And I was like, no, she doesn't reciprocate that. And he's like, no, no, she does, she does. And I'm like, no, she doesn't. So I don't know, like boundaries and conversations with DMs, super important. And everyone here is a good bean. And like, it's like, yeah, talk to your players. Um, don't force your players to do things and be gay, do crimes. Well, yeah, because we were talking about this, like I'm, we're talking about this in chat. A lot of people use like fantasy and fiction as like that veil to hide behind in order to like push intolerant ideas. Like they'll be like, oh, this character's in jail because like they and their husband did something. And I'm like, is it because they're like a gay thing? And they're like, no, it's a crimes thing. And I'm like, okay, so it's about a gay thing. And that's one of the big problems about trying to have these conversations is that a lot of times people will use it as like, it's a fantasy thing to cover up like homophobia or transphobia or like racism or ethnocentrism. Like, let's let's take away the veil and realize that fantasy has just as many real implications as interactions with actual people. <laughs> I, I kind of have a question since I do have people on here that whose experiences are quite different than mine. I, I, I get a comment from my players and they, they say it with love and they, they truly they truly enjoy enjoy our time. But it's we have this kind of thing where they're like, you ever notice that all the NPCs we encounter are, real, are, are just a little bit sassy and usually gay? <laughs> and like that goes from the ancient black dragon all over the way down to like knife guy, the peasant and um, uh, so I, I guess one of the things, uh, uh, representation in tabletop RPG and all that, when, when you DM, when you run a game, do you find yourself, do you find your, how do you default your NPCs? Because I tend to default my NPCs as women just to, just to do that, just to help not default as men. Um, but I, like, as far as their attitude, they, you know, at that point, they basically all come across like drag queens or, <laughs> or what have you, you know what I mean? And, um, I guess, you know, when you're in the DMs chair, do, how, how do you find yourself stepping into, like, that portrayal? And, like, do you find yourself wanting to default NPCs to a certain way? And that, how do you, I guess I'm saying, like, how does your expression of self go when you're GMing? That's the question. Mm. Snark. It's definitely there. Um, yeah, touch of bitchiness. Yeah, it, that sort of... I don't like what you're doing as a GM, so I'm going to backhandedly mention it as an NPC. And it's going to be canon, so you can't tell me off. And it's not from me, it's from a character. So, that, that, that's, that's, that's what I put in. Because <laughs> you, have, you have to vent your frustration somewhere, and if you can't just talk to your other GMs about it... <laughs> It's kind of like, you're doing a stupid thing. I know you're doing a stupid thing. Let's have an NPC point out the stupid thing. Oh God, you're still doing the stupid thing. Rocks fall, you all die. You, uh, I will say that from my perspective, you sound very much like a writer who GMs, like someone who is, <laughs> you sound like a writer. <laughs> yeah, master's degree in literature and creative writing. Yeah, so. you, you, sound <laughs> you sound exactly like someone who writes. Yep. Yep. I'm a writer. Yeah. Nice yep. deal. No, um, I was running my players through a, a heavily modified version of the Fandelver adventure. And there's the, the scene with the green dragon, which I replaced with a copper dragon because I felt one, it could be a, a little more fun and not necessarily become just a, a free for all try to kill the PCs event. And the, the players had already killed the cultists in the ruined village. And they had done it while the cultists were asleep. They had completely done a, a tactically speaking, were great. They, they snuck in and they killed the so-called evildoers. Well, when they tried to approach the dragon, they were doing it from the, this whole mindset of, hey, we're all good guys. 
and the dragon verbally bitch slapped them with the sense that, you know, you all just did something morally evil and, and let them run with their tail between their legs. But it gave them something to, to talk about when they ran the hell away. And then when they had their next encounter with uh, the necromancer at the well, they were second guessing what they were doing because now there was this moral argument that, yeah, he was evil and he had zombies, but he wasn't trying to, to attack them. Oh. In that case, I thought it worked perfect from a DM standpoint, but yeah, it was definitely Mr. Copper Dragon was, was not happy and, and that was all snark. That was yeah. definitely DM being, um, telling them I, a peace of mind. <laughs> Yeah, I have. I had a Sunday group where three of the characters became protagonists, and so everything they did was in the right, regardless if it was horrific. And every time, the problem is, is that once your players become sort of that sort of protagonist role, any character that then doesn't agree with them is a problem, rather than, oh no, we should actually consider it. It's more like, no, you've just got an opposite viewpoint. <laughs> we're not doing it. We're not doing wrong. We're not. Yes, we have to murder all of these people, but we're good people. <laughs> when you, it's just like yeah, I'm. No, I'm we're, not. Not. <laughs> we're, we're doing a morality challenge. You know the the kobolds under the town that um, aren't attacking anyone. They're just making warns and dealing with sewage. So I'm really kind of challenging them on their ideas of of good and evil. And doing it while they're at low level so that when it becomes a point where, yeah, they could kind of probably kill just about everyone, that they don't. Ink, go off, queen. <laughs> so some people in chat are talking about like how difficult it can be sometimes to portray LGBT characters or characters who are not of the same orientation as you. How do you guys tend to deal with that like especially when you create npcs or like characters for games that you want to play because that's a whole thing is that a lot of people who are allies are like i want to make characters that are visible but i don't want to adhere to a stereotype i think that see my perspective on this one especially when i dm i think that we communicate through fiction I think that we we have narratives. I, I, I'm not saying that stereotypes are good, but I think that tropes are powerful. And I think that even as people, even as the career community, I think we find comfort. Uh, I will say I found comfort in tropes. And I know other queer people who have found comfort in tropes and live live their lives inspired by some of the tropes that they, they see. You know, you know, gay men, especially the ones that I've known in my life, we we love to get sassy and really bitchy when we're out out. You know, I love to go to Sunday brunch with my queens and like see I'm doing it right now. Like I'm falling into like all this, but it's comforting for me. And um, it, it and none of those things are are particularly problematic or harmful. But so I I think that you know it's important not to fall into stereotypes when DMing. But when I when I DM, I lean on I tend to lean on po powerful fiction and tropes that I've seen emulated by the people I've known in my life. Um, I knew a lot of drag queens. There was a period in my life where I was, I was involved in the drag community in a small town in Michigan. And uh, I think of those people all the time when I'm, when I'm uh, uh, role playing uh, drag queens or um, just um, uh, uh, queer uh, um, men or even sometimes queer women. So that, that's, that's how I think of it. I know um, one thing, if you're cis, hetero, what, what have you, that you can also do that a lot of people tend to forget or ignore is that most people in the alternate spaces aren't really all that different. You can play a gay man as virtually no different than you would a straight man. It's just gonna be, um, if he's the bartender, then maybe he's not giving the eye at a pretty girl in the party. You know, you, you don't have to go um, full bore on, on any of these things. It doesn't have to be the flashy drag queen trope. It could just be the normal 
guy that you wouldn't have expected. It can, and it can be true for any one of them. If you don't make it weird and you don't make it about that as the only point of their character, then you're also less likely to offend someone if that's your concern. Do you? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I just feel like from my like from my experience as like a queer human, going from like bi to straight to bi to pan back to bi to straight again, and then wherever the fuck we are now, I don't know. Um, <laughs> here queer crimes. Um, I just I like, and having lived in those spaces like so much and like surrounded myself with like a bunch of pan people and like vi people and those cultures i don't really especially straight culture i have a very intimate understanding of straight culture um but uh <laughs> i just i don't really think about it when i'm making npcs i'm just like i write the character and i'm like oh he has a wife oh she has a girlfriend oh the oh they're like this oh you're non-binary it's fine like whatever I don't know so I guess any advi advice that I would have for someone who's having difficulty with that is just like read it and talk to people I don't know just like sensitivity reading is good if you're homebrewing um yeah just do your homework and but they're, by they're people <laughs> right by straight culture do you mean like double coupon day and 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 miracle whip is that is that what straight culture is because i'm unfamiliar with it <laughs> yeah you know it's it's a distant memory um sometimes i get flashbacks of it living in the suburbs it's weird cargo getting, pants and uncomfortable yeah, wine mom exactly. don't I'm, speak I'm, to I'm me seen, of cargo pants i've seen I, cargo pants and, and socks with sandals Okay, oh. we never did that part. Well, I've seen a lot of that, and I've seen a lot of cargo pants. I've seen it, some shit, man. It's like the moms <laughs> wearing shirts with puns on wine every day, even to their kids' like five-year birthday party. That's right. All the time. Have you guys ever been asked by people outside of the community to like sensitivity weed, and would you be willing to? That's a real question. I would definitely be willing to. Um, I've had people kind of try to ask me to do it and been like hey is this lesbian okay and i'm like i mean no and they're like cool great bye and i'm like neat um <laughs> so it's like i feel like also as someone who doesn't exist necessarily in that space or like that's not their reality um being open to the criticism of oh no this is all wrong like this is not how this culture works like here's how like six thousand uh resources on how it does work and like here's my lived experience here's a couple of testimonials like being open to that as a dm and as a writer i think is super important um and i would love to sensitivity read if anyone wants it <laughs> that's also a really good point remember to pay your sensitivity readers i was about to say i, pay I have not and i would the only thing is with uh, at least with trans experience, there's a lot of intersectionality when it comes to people of color and trans. And there's also a lot of generational differences with trans. Um, the younger someone is, the less likely they have gone through a lot of the shame, guilt cycles that some of the older people are. And so there are different challenges and different relationships that um, trans people have in both um, female to male, male to female, and, and by age bracket. So be aware of that, although that doesn't tend to matter really for, for gaming purposes. I think it's also important to remember that representation is never going to be 100% perfect, because there's always going to be someone who finds that there's a fault, or there's going to be someone who has a different experience and is like, oh yeah, this isn't how my experience was, so you're doing this wrong. But it's more when we give criticism to people, especially people outside of the community, or like I've had to talk to some people who aren't Asian, who are trying to write Asian characters that are starting to fall into like the Mulan stereotype. When we tell you that you're doing this wrong, we're not saying that you're a bad person. Like, I don't want you to take it as you're representing us wrong as a, I think you're a terrible person, you should stop. It's more 
we want you to learn from this. We don't want you to feel discouraged, but we don't want you to continue as you are because you're gonna end up harming us more than helping us. Because that's a fine line between understanding that you're doing a bad thing versus you being a bad person. And that's a lot of, that's a line that a lot of people tend to mess up, especially when it comes to sensitivity reading and like community interaction with people. Yeah, I will just say that I, I, I would not offer my services as a sensitivity reader because I'm cis and white and uh, pretty economically privileged. And the only, the only thing, the only thing, uh, the only thing I would have to offer is the sensitivity of, of being gay. And I, I, I feel, and, and not, not that, that that experience isn't, isn't valid or worthy, but I, I, I think money is better spent in other sensitivities. I think that white cis gay men have a large enough presence and a large enough voice in a lot of our spaces that we can we can we can just speak up when when we're when we're having a problem. And I and obviously that's like that's dealing with very small problems in like very small spaces, you know. But I, I wouldn't offer myself as a sensitivity reader myself. Yeah, that's a whole thing too, especially with like marginalized communities like the gay community. There are also levels of privilege yeah. and benefits within it like you said like being a white cis gay man there's an element of privilege to that that doesn't exist to like black tra trans gay men and like non-binary gay men and stuff like that mm -hmm. so even within like marginalized ideas like i'm relatively privileged because i grew up in it like a middle class area of america yeah. and even though i wasn't one of there weren't many asian people in my school I wasn't really treated differently once we hit like middle school. Mm -hmm. So there is that level of, even though I have like those daily struggles with people that I'm not interacting with on the daily, there's like a level of privilege to all of that. So really the sensitivity needs to be specific and not generalized. If you want someone who's um, Asian and non-binary and young, you really want a sensitivity reader who is like that. And, and not just cherry pick the piece. Oh, let me just get someone who's gay to do it. Right, yeah. And I feel like, and I will just say, I feel like as a white gay man who's been in this space for a year, I, I'm very thankful for the success I've had. I'm very thankful for the offers that have approached me, but it's, and I, I have my own voice and my own thing, but I feel like if I offered my services in that space, I would be taking a lot of slots that belong to people with a more valuable voice to read. I feel like without checking that privilege, I would definitely be filling the role that is better served by um, a black trans woman uh, offering their sensitivity. I, I think publishers and writers in that space who are just trying to cover their ass are going to lean to white gay men to do their sensitivity reading. You know what I mean? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, someone brought up a point in chat. Do you think that privilege levels only appear in any country worldwide? I think that privilege doesn't exist as a single thing, like we designated said. There's different aspects, like there will be economic, there will be racial, there will be gender and sexuality. And depending on where you live in the world, that will change. Like there are some places in the world where being gay is a very celebrated thing. There are some cultures in Native America that have like two spirit genders where you're celebrated as like a, like a, great person for their culture. I don't know enough about that to speak in length, but privilege is going to exist in different spheres depending on where you live and the history that your identity has in that area. Like, for example, being neurodivergent in Asia is a very looked down upon thing where being neurodivergent in America, if you try to get help, people are like, oh, I'm so happy for you. You're going to get help and it's good that you're doing this and not bottling it up anymore. In some spaces, at least. <laughs> yeah, like it, it depends on where you are. Yeah. And I guess the history that you specifically and other people like you have had there. Um, let's see. Do you see privilege as something bad by nature or can it be good? That's a really interesting question. So so one thing. So let's let's just keep the conversation about uh, like our own experiences. We're not here to comment on like larger issues that we can't quite speak to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, this is not a panel of expertise, and we're focusing specifically as tabletop RPG creators and, and queer people. Um, so, uh, 
yeah, it, yeah that, that is a very good conversation to, to have on privilege and we can all recognize our own privileges in, in, the, in this space, but um, we're, we're, not, we're not a panel, we're not impaneled as experts. We're just here to talk about our own experiences in a, in a kind of casual way. Even though some of us do have expertise, that's nice and that's great, but we're, that's not what we're here to do today. Um, so to kind of continue the thread, uh, so we've talked about tabletop RPG. We've talked about um, uh, representations in, in media. We've talked about uh, privilege on some level. Uh, and we've talked, we've touched a little bit on validation. The next topic, see this gets into, so we need to ensure that we're personalizing this. So one of the things, one of the last little things that we can kind of talk about, um, I think is our, is our history as queer people, queer history, but in a sense of like, what does that mean to us? What does queer history mean to each person here at that panel? And um, I'll let anyone who wishes start. Queer silence. <laughs> um, then go ahead, Ink. If not, I'll just talk. Okay. I guess, especially as we enter like the Pride Month thing where a lot of people are trying to benefit off the gay pride wave, it's more that we have to understand who came before us and what that means for us now. Like there's a lot of people who will get caught up in that whole wave of like, oh, I'm so happy to be gay and out and then forget that there were other people that came before us and had to pave all of this for us. Like the Stonewall riots and Moshe Johnson and everything like that, there isn't, like queer history never exactly stops. We keep going and we keep making it. And even if it's like small impacts, the way that we impact this history and how other people will view it, especially people from within the community is very important. So we have to recognize it as a past thing, as a present thing and as a future thing. So in, in, in your own life, how, how, what, how, how did you discover, how did you learn and how did you first discover uh, queer history? I grew up in a relatively heteronormative white country kind of suburban area. So for me, I had like friends that were gay that were never really out, but super proud about it. And a lot of my kind of queer history came out of like doing my own research and exploring my own gender and doing like, whether it was Googling or researching things. And then I started to realize, oh, this isn't like a microcosm. There are more people that exist in this space and I should listen to other people rather than just assuming that I am an individual and I'm the only one who's ever going to exist like me. And I guess it was just, accepting that I sit in a place of privilege because I didn't have to go through all of that, like I said, but also understanding that there is work that I can do, especially with having such an online presence and a voice for people like me, that queer history is not, it's not, a, it shouldn't be a place of shame and it should really be like a place to jump off and have conversations. Yeah. Tesla, how about you? Uh, how, uh, what was your first experiences learning about queer history, that kind of thing, in that journey? I think mainly, again, I think it's because in Britain, it's if, as long as you're kind of in more of any slight more centralized, urbanized areas, there's a bit more of a community. Or if you're in more of the more of the, shall we say, yeah, densely populated areas, there's a lot more of a community aspect to that, and as such, that there's a lot more availability to the history side of aspects of it because there's just generally more people there to talk about it. Um, whereas I come from a little bit out of the sticks, out in the world, out, out of sort of a central area. And so we didn't really, there wasn't that much of that sort of active culture there and thus didn't really become part of any sort of teachings. I think that's generally in the UK, that's a big thing that's going through right now is the, um, well, LGBT plus, LGBTQ plus teaching. And that, that's a huge issue going on right now. There's protests currently going outside of one of the schools in England um, about that, about the whole fact that they don't want to teach that as sexual health or mental health or cultural stuff. As it's kind of just like they're saying, we don't want that in our school. 
kind of thing. So there's still issues like that today. I found out Mank because of that kind of stigma around it. It wasn't really brought up in history books, even as sort of a class thing, even though there was quite a significant history in the UK about it um, until um, at that point, like about 10 years ago, um, when I was at university. And because there were societies there, and obviously we have things like LGBT month anyway, it became part of like the social calendar. And we had at the uni pretty much large billboard spaces all over the campus. And when it was Pride Month, LGBT history was plastered over every available space. So billboards, staircases, signs where you're meant to be sticking up posters for the student union, <laughs> walls, the common rooms, every, it was basically everywhere. And that was the first kind of sort of active exposure to it. But I suppose now that, like I said, we're get up in the UK, there are primary schools for ages like under 12 being petitioned by the parents to not teach this kind of stuff which is it needs to be done because it, it's it's again it's like basically living in the colonial era and just basically brushing the whole of slavery under the rug like it, it happens it's happening right now but you don't need to talk about it like it's not important right now just it's 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 how the world works but you don't need to know how that how the world works you just stay with your little tiny viewpoint and everything will be fine um but again, age of the internet, there is no way that, unless you are actively trying to remain single-minded, there is no way that you can, in a day of information sharing, remain single-mindedly without consciously going against or actively discriminating. Um, but yeah, my, my, yeah, it was at uni that I got the education about it, like the proper sort of historical side of things, but yeah, sorry, that was my... <laughs> I appreciate and value your perspective. Thank you for sharing. Sam or Michaela? Mm, I wasn't part of um, an awareness of being queer until after I transitioned. Um, since I always liked girls, it was always just one of those things that never even had occurred to me that I was gay. So therefore, I never really looked into it. Now that I'm in and have been in Los Angeles, it's kind of all over the place within the circles and communities I'm in. Um, and I've met people who have been part of gay or trans history in the sense of, um, I've met people who have been a part of challenging a lot of the legal laws. Of course, laws are legal. Um, a lot of the laws regarding um, trans rights within sports and and those kinds of things. Um, I haven't really been part or aware too much other than the big things, you know, Stonewall and, and what have you. So really, as far as history being alive, it's just one of those um, try to be out every day, whether it's Pride Month or, or not, and I've got to live my life. So that is a collective with all the other people who are doing it is how I'm living pride and queer history every day. It's, that's the only way forward. I started, I started in an embarrassed, no, I'm not fucking embarrassed. It was Rent. I started with Rent. Uh, Cause I was a theater kid and uh, still technically a theater kid somewhere inside of me, I am told. Um, I saw Rent for the first time and I went, well, first I went, holy shit, there are people like me in the fucking world, awesome. And then I went, holy shit, what's AIDS? Cause I was, you know, kind of young. People always see Rent kind of young, I think. Um, and then, you know, so many questions after seeing that and then I did research and then I read about it and I was like, this is terrible. And then I read The Normal Heart and I was like, this is terrible. And then you read Angels in America and you're like, this was terrible too. Not the, not the material, just like things that happened and were real. And then, you know, I have this really, I remember my first pride parade um, or my, my first pride I went to 
which surprisingly wasn't bad here in the deep south tm um and i remember there was like a sign like a freestanding sign up and it had like a brief history of stonewall and i had like heard about stonewall before but i didn't really know what it was and then i read that and i was like holy shit um, so I did research about that and then I got older and I've read more books and it's just like realizing that while coming out and into my identity, I feel very lucky, uh, very privileged to have had that experience, like growing up with the internet, having that, I cannot imagine what it was like without the internet. So I commend anyone who <laughs> had to figure things out without it. Um, so yeah, it was rent fuck it <laughs> like but like art is so powerful you know so that's why that's why representation matters tm thanks for coming to my ted talk no the the internet's made a big deal in terms of um allowing people to find tribes that weren't there before that your only way of potentially finding this was was it someone in high school that you knew and then back then it might have been, uh, regardless of how you felt, would approaching someone like that be good for you or not? And if you were going to talk to them about it from an information standpoint, they might have likely been on their guard. Um, college was a little different because then we started seeing um, by glass and organizations like that. And my last year in college was basically the year the internet first started exploding. So. 95. Um, but even then, you still didn't get all of the information spaces that we have now. Um, we had things like Prodigy and CompuServe and AOL, and then IRC was also all part of that. So some of those channels, IRC is very close to the way Discord works, if that's uh, an alien term for, for everyone. Um, so you could find a channel about this or that and you could start getting the kind of information that would allow you to come to terms with who or, or what you were or how you felt. So yeah, you are all very lucky if you're younger and this is just all you know, because it wasn't that way. And in the generation before mine, it was even crazier. Yeah, that's that's such a that's such a good point about the internet. Like, I mean, just even now, like I'm looking at a chat and like, you know, like, like we're all gay here like we're all queer here like we're all we're like like i i i don't know mad fish longer but i'm just gonna go ahead and say that they're queer that's fine <laughs> uh but you know what i mean like i look at the chat list and it's like non-binary and, and bi and, and uh, demis and just like beautiful lgbtq people all just getting together in this space and creating this content that that is a beautiful thing the internet is beautiful for that reason terrible for many other reasons but it's a beautiful thing <laughs> um on the subject of queer history, so I will I will um, talk about my own experiences, um, but I again am not I am not passing myself off as an expert. I'm going to try to just talk about my own experiences. But however, I have a funny <laughs> I have a funny experience with queer history. I majored in history and economics in college. I was a you know. Uh, um, I actually got paid to go to college and I had all these awards and I had all this history and it wasn't until my very last um, two years where I joined a LGBTQIA plus uh, seminar. And I had actually not taken any uh, history co uh, history courses involved in that topic until that seminar. And I, I actually got paid to do that on, on, in that summer. And I got to work with the legendary uh, queer historian, John D'Amelio, for anyone who knows that name. And that, I basically went from knowing, <laughs> I went from knowing about that much about gay history to that much you know what I mean um um but it was it was I, I had been at this thing for so long and, and in my own experience like done so well and like I was literally getting paid to go to school and I was being paid to do research and it wasn't until year three and four uh that I discovered LGBTQI plus history as a gay man I had studied uh, economic comparators in the Soviet Union, developments in uh, uh, socioeconomic strata and all that stuff. And it was all very, you know, all very, all very whatever. Um, but it wasn't until my last summer 
and then my either second to last or last semester where I actually took queer courses and I actually flew out to Washington DC to the National Archives and we explored like their LGBTQIA history section which is not great but I hopefully has come come along in the years since I've left that space. Um, but I, I think it's very interesting. So from my experience and my perspective on that as, a, as someone who literally did that professionally for a time in my life, it is interesting how queer history is hid from us from a young age to an even more advanced age. I mean, you gotta go out, you, you gotta go out, you gotta take the gay course to learn about gay history. <laughs> you do, let's just, let's just say it. And my, my university was very left wing, like, um, and my, my, my professors all had PhDs from Harvard and University of Chicago. They're all highly, highly educated. It wasn't until I went to work with the gay English, the two gay English professors and the John D'Amelio the legendary gay historian and like had to sign up for it, had to go out of my way. I only got in because of all my credentials. And then the following year, I had to take the LGBTQIA plus history course, which wasn't in history. It was in queer studies. It was in queer slash women studies. And you got to go out of your way to learn this stuff in so many of the our institutions and in the spaces when in fact, the material relationship and like the history of like it, again from my perspective like my perspective is like gayness queerness sexuality is such a part of our our our, our collective experience it's a crime that it's not taught from a very young age um man fishmonger had mentioned about how people really don't know much about the aids crisis and, and that was actually what i studied specifically yeah go ahead so, go so do you remember Matthew Shepard and things like Freddie Mercury dying and all those kinds of things? Because, I mean, I do, but... I, I literally only learned about it because I got paid to do it. You know, and that was literally as someone who studied history. I ended up studying a man called... I ended up um, writing a paper on a man called Ortez Anderson, actually, who was um, a, a small, a complicated man from the AIDS movement who had basically been lost to obscurity. There really wasn't much written about him. There's now a bit more written about him. It's really hard to find information on him. Um, and he was a member, oh God, I'm pulling on information from like eight years ago. <laughs> oh, here, doing it live. Uh, he was a member of ACT UP, but then he was more notoriously known for getting arrested as a member of either the Pontiac Five or the Peoria Five. I cannot remember which, which piece city it is. Um, but he was he was a member of the like the he 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 did die of complications from AIDS, um, but he he was a member of ACT UP and one of the kind of uh, one of the founding uh, uh, members. So, but that's a whole thing that happened in Reagan's whole neglect of it and everything that is hidden from that that catastrophe is hidden, and you gotta go you gotta go out of your way to learn about this stuff. Well, yeah, because to some extent it's that idea that like LGBTQ stuff and racism and other societal issues that have faced us are still a thing that should be like hidden away from children or kept from you until you're like mature and old enough to make that decision. When I know that there was a lot of queer kids, especially me who like sat in like sex ed class and were like, okay, so how does this work for me and for other people? And I'm sure especially kids that are like intersex that are growing up are even more confused. So to learn about history and be able to talk about slavery and talk about like that in World War II, but not talk about like how the Red Cross was formed and how gay men still can't give blood to the Red Cross. Like that's something that we completely ignore that should not be ignored, especially if you're in high school and you should be old enough by that time to understand that this is a mature conversation that people need to have. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So now I'm wondering if Freddie Mercury ever ever played D&D. <laughs> oh, he's 100% a bard. 100%. I mean, T Flang. T Flang bard. Do you play bard when you when you're when you're someone like Freddie Mercury or do you go against type? You know what I mean? Like I tend not to play I love playing wizards, but I, lately I play against type. Like I try not to play the his, the scholars. I want him to be a warlock, but that's because I'm a tiefling warlock. So, 
Um, so uh, we're coming up here on an hour and a half. Um, I I actually want to. So I, what I want to do here is just finish off if if we feel comfortable. I want to just go around and kind of talk about. I, I kind of like the idea since Michaela kind of brought up. Let's talk about our favorite kind of characters and why we play them, like types and stuff, and why we play them. If anyone wants to start off, yeah. <laughs> Um, my, my favorite character, because I'm the GM, never the player, um, I've had to create my own favorite NPC, who is in every single campaign. Um, it, it's gotten to the point where he's called, basically, he's called Angus McNernan, or the Red Jester. If you've played older editions, you may have seen a stat block or similar. Um, and... Uh, he's, he started off as a, an inquisitor for the Raven Queen as a bard. And in my homebrew, I've got like a religious bard subclass. So he was playing that alongside being a rogue. He then betrayed the queen, betrayed the king, slept with the queen, got assassinated nearly, went completely insane, had his story written about him in a board game, the board game that got Jumanji'd, and he then escaped out of the board game. So it's kind of like playing like an over-the-top fictionalized character in the first place. But because I Jumanji'd him, um, he's also got a bit of Deadpool type fourth wall break. But the real world that the players are in is the fourth wall. Um, and it's he's just gotten to the point where I've had players request him in-game specifically. Um, or I've actually had one player who said that they made this character made them so nervous it made them nearly sick. And I, <laughs> I mean, that's not exactly something you want to hear from a player, but being able to elicit that kind of reaction from just one NPC, uh, a memorable, shall we say, interaction, yeah. and it's all it's it's. I mean, it's even gotten to the point where sorry, I'm going to break my background. <laughs> um, <laughs> Amazing. Man, I can't believe this is all a show. <laughs> oh, is that a painting? Yeah, that's Toro Toro there, and that's something, uh, that's, uh, oh god. You'll be able, it's Uma Thurman. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> this is Yorick, uh, the Jester's Familiar. Okay. Which I've homebrewed as a, basically a talking skull as his familiar and my parents actually went uh, to Italy and I got a proper jester's mask. Uh, he is, that from he, Venice? He is in, yeah, it's, well, it's a, it's a proper, it's a la, 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 Venetian mask, mm -hmm. um, but it's done in the right colors uh, and it's the Harlequin-esque. Um, but yeah, he's, he's just, it's a character because I don't get to play because he's been in so many different campaigns, I've been able to flesh him out to the point where he feels like my character, which I kind of maybe now regret. <laughs> Taking a life of his own kind of behavior and it's kind of like, oh God, <laughs> am I going too far with this character? But uh, someone who's completely mad and also slightly half a God, half a demon, half Jumanji. <laughs> That does not equal 100%. <laughs> His mind doesn't equal 100%. <laughs> and, and what is it about that character that, that uh, appeals to you? Why, why do you think you keep coming back to them? I think it's mainly because he is an utter outsider. He is literally someone that doesn't exist, but is based off of someone that did and is constantly living up to expectations and reputations of history, while also trying to forge his own path and do it his own way. Comes across a lot of resistance because his way is very specific, but I just like the idea that there's this character who doesn't know what's going really going on, makes the best of a bad situation, tries to take charge of it, and puts their own interpretation on it to the point where that's their definition and they're not going to have their mind changed. Someone who doesn't take other people's 
ideas um, or stereotypes and holds on to them. It's just like, well, why do you think like that? That's 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 a bit stupid, isn't it? Um, and there's that kind of there's just slight slight. It, it is it is just my way of being able to comment on my own setting as well without sort of that sort of even sort of taking the mick out of the whole like you set up an entire complicated scenario and even i've got a character that can just poke fun at what i'm doing myself and so it's see the absurdity the trickster yeah see the absurdity in even what i'm doing which then allows me to appreciate and almost like takes a level of pressure off because if I'm even if I've got an NPC that knows that this is insane, so then my players know this is insane. So it's kind of that. It's just, oh, I don't know. I'm ranting again, but it's just, <laughs> it's it's again. It, I think it is literally just someone that is the other that looks from the outside and tries to make sense of the world, and then plays by their own rules, which is something I kind of want to aspire to. Right. I think that says a lot right there. That's that's beautiful. On the shelf you go, Yorick. <laughs> Next, uh, well, what, what kind of characters do you like to embody and why do you think that is, you know? Oh, I guess I'll go. I'm checking to see if Anchor Sam unmute first so that I don't jump in on anyone. Um, I grew up with the Dragonlance books. So Raceland, like a lot of people was always the kind of underdog outsider look different um wizard so i tend to play a lot of magic users um warlocks weren't a thing when i played so i played one at dnd live and uh, i've got an npc in the works um for my game and the the whole underdog and, and raceland thing um has a historical context with me because back in 96, I worked for TSR at Gen Con and pre-transition, I was Raceland for the launch of Dragonlance Fifth Age. So I had the hourglass eyes, which were expensive contact lenses. I still have the staff of Magius. And you know, this was, and this made it out for the first time in 23 years at D&D Live this year. So the whole underdog, um, eldritch power, um, being able to be an outsider that can force people to sit up, notice, and take you seriously, whether that was just as a, a, a little white gamer guy or uh, a queer person, or anyone really in, in a space where marginalization and the feeling of a lack of agency can can pervade. So that's always been something that's that's driven the kinds of characters I play when I do play. Normally I'm I'm the DM. Awesome. So I just need one thing. I need you to tell me. Uh, where you live and when you're not at home for reasons <laughs> that have to deal with me getting that staff. <laughs> That's amazing that you have that. That's really awesome, Michaela. Thank you for sharing that. Sam, do you want to go? Okay, so then I guess I'll go. <laughs> Gay silence. Um, so I, for a while, was like a chronic DM as most of us are. Yeah, I, I see you there, Tesla. Um, but recently because of like the Curse of Lords and Ravnica, and I'm actually gonna make a podcast soon with Jess of Health Pack Stream called Three Feelings where we pay, play through the entirety of the Uncaged Anthology. I've noticed that even though I have like really bad memory issues, I tend to play spellcasters, which is not good because then I'm like, what do I have for spells? What do I have going on? Like, I have my page marked and everything. But I tend to play spellcasters that kind of subvert, like, the typical ideas. Like, I'm playing a cleric that does not have any healing spells. Like, I'm playing a sorcerer who has, like, no spells that are, like, typically useful. 
and who is it like my other character from curse of words is just just has weird abilities so i tend to play what is usually like an archetype of a character like a human cleric a tiefling warlock and then i tend to subvert it with like an aspect of their class feature so that's that's what i like to do because i like being not always useful but always funny i guess so yeah I'm a slut for patrons, y'all. I, <laughs> I, so like, I have always been really into warlocks. Um, and even when like, I wasn't into tabletop and I just, I don't know the concept of selling your soul for something like Faust, I was really into Faust. Um, like step on me, hot evil lady demon, I guess. Um, and <laughs> God, I'm gay. Wow. Um, I lost my train of thought there because I was thinking about Zugtmoy. Um, <laughs> clerics. Uh, I do clerics a lot too because um, I like to have, um, I don't know, I like weird back and forths with, um, I like to have back and forths with like, I like the reluctant cleric, the one who's like, I don't want to do this anymore and the patrons, or not the patron, the domain's like, you gotta and it's like no I don't know I'm playing one of those in the old myths so um I don't know there's something about maybe it's because I went to Catholic school for 13 years I don't know there's something about the push and pull of like relationship I really wanted to do a, ro a romantic-ish relationship with a patron at some point uh but I like spellcasters I don't make me punch that. I don't know. I d have this weird hatred of, not hatred, I just, aversion is a better word, to like anything martial. I don't understand them. I really want to play gunslinger though. But like, I'm rambling about characters. I like th them gay. I, <laughs> I, I think that um, tieflings are the gayest, followed by Genasi. And then Fallen Osmar, specifically Fallen Osmar, because I can be an emo kid. Um, I don't know. I like the weird outsider, bitchy. I almost said dropped a hard C bomb. Um, <laughs> I don't. What can I tell you? I I'm this brass usually in my characters, um, and I don't know. Patron slut. You should pay a gunslinger. You should. Yeah, I'm picturing a super, but like perhaps butch, like lesbian gunslinger. When you said that, oh, I want. That's it. the plan. She's a tiefling. I've already made her. I just don't have a place for her yet. Do it. Pathfinder has a really good gunslinger class. I've played one. It's very fun. Do, Pathfinder oh, yeah. scares me though. That's another conversation we can have. Just do it. D and D also has a good gunslinger class. Thanks to Matt Mercer. Yeah, it does. I look at that and I'm just like, please do it. Do it. I've played it. So That's good. not what I wanted to say out loud. Uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone clip that, please. No, no. <laughs> I'm, playing Mercer, blood, I'm playing a blood hunter, but I went profane soul, so like also patron slut. I just <sighs> is Matt Mercer your patron? No, not yet. <laughs> He's not in my basement yet. <laughs> Sorry, I was busy clipping. <laughs> oh no! Here we go. We, this is this is. There we go. There we go. That's there now. So we're good. It's called adding, and I'm doing it live. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that. I will just talk very briefly about my own. I, I lately uh, use uh, I, the characters I tend to like to play are spellcasters. And thank you, Michaela, for the bits. And thank you for Camilla for the bits. That's really awesome that it, your bits will go to support Trans Lifeline. Um, but lately, I've been playing characters that are rather, they explore my sexuality to be certain, and they explore absolutely. Uh, but I, I have been playing characters that are super shitty. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Like Johnny and Dragon Heisters is shitty. He lies all the time and he, he manipulates people. Um, and then Peter in Urban Shadows is the fucking worst. 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, however, Fisher in in Come On in the Water's Queer is is more based on how I am, well, at least how I try to be usually, which is uh, uh, a big gay for a bulk. <laughs> Thank you, Camilla, again for the bits. Um, and I tend to like spellcasters. I, I, I think that I think that there are two. <laughs> I think that if you're a member of the LGBTQI community, I've, I have observed a bias towards plague spellcasters or monks. <laughs> I feel like there's a bias there. But um, yeah, I, I tend to play uh, spellcasters and uh, wizards and uh, sorcerers and just. <sighs> but yeah, lately here, personality wise. Thank you, uh, Crime Nap, for the bits. I uh, have just been playing shitty characters. And I think that's it allows me to explore, at the same time I'm exploring my gender and sexuality, I get to explore, you know, the reasons why I am the way I am. And that's, that's really cool. That's beautiful. That's a, that's a heel click in good time, as we call, as we say where I'm from. <sighs> Is there anything else anyone wishes to say before we do the wrap up? These bits are making me want to cry. This is so nice. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. We almost did the five bit goal for the month. We're almost there. Almost there. And we've Look, got five percent left. Yeah. Yay. Thank you, everybody. And for all you don't know, is when people donate like bits this month, you, uh, randomly random people are getting or get distributed queer themed emotes and they're under unlocked in your little emote menu. So they're really, oh, I have the give and the pride take. I have the give and the take. Thank you to whoever got me that. This is beautiful. I've ascended. I am the uber homosexual now. The mega gay. I am the mega gay. <laughs> like, it's like being a mega zord, but it's just all gay. Oh. There, are five, there are five zords inside you. They are all gay. You are gay. <laughs> Um, so why don't we go around, tell people who we are, uh, <laughs> Knox, but yeah, um, and tell them where you can find you, and uh, yeah, that, that'll be it. We'll start, we'll go in reverse order, let's start with Michaela. Um, I don't know, you can find me on Twitter, Michaela underscore V underscore Sims. Um, I don't know what I'm doing, so I'm not on any streams currently, I pop up now and again on something like this or on Scraticus, but uh, we'll see where that goes. And as far as my Twitter stream, I've been posting map stuff and some other things. So um, that's about it for me. That's awesome. Hope to see more of you there. Um, Ink. Hi, my name is Ink. You can find me on Twitter at These Dead Pens. You can also find me on Twitter under the at Curse of Lords on Twitter podcast, where I play Thorn, your gender bending friend of the night. Um, I will be here on Monday at eight o'clock Eastern playing uh, Asimov, the human disaster of a cleric for Ravnica, barely legal. I also do freelance art and all kinds of stuff, so f feel free to check me out on Twitter. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, Tesla. Okay. Um, chucked everything into the chat. Um, so I'm at the RPG Lab on Twitter, the website, rpglab.com, Twitch, same thing. Um, also chucked into the Discord as well, if you want to come join us. We've got community games every Saturday, so if I'm not here or doing something else on a Saturday, um, we have an open table policy. So as long as you grab a whole bunch of people together to play a game, I'll put it on, essentially. Um, but apart from that, we stream generally around 7 p.m. BST, so lunchtime, daytime for you American folks, unfortunately, but we do have VODs. Um, but we're here Monday, Sunday through to Friday. But Saturdays is optional. <laughs> love it, love it. Some of my favorite uh, times have been when I wake up early enough and I I, I, I watch, I was watching like End of the World Coachella and like some of the oh, RPGs. End of the World Coachella, that was fun. It was so good. <laughs> that I, was played, like... I played a character who basically, could, I was playing the, the Artificer and I had the ability to make healing potions. I'm making a, I had like a jug of alchemy and we allowed it so that I could create a very, 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 very weak healing potion, which restored one HP. And we just gave it to all of the half dead people. 
So they instantly regained one HP, regained consciousness, and were instantly pissed. Mm -hmm. um, and then we then sent them out into a desert. <laughs> yep, yep. And that was the part I caught. And uh, afterwards, I was like, I am watching this thing to the bitter end. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. <laughs> the I worst. My, my character doesn't care of consequences. It's just for the sheer, ooh, wonder if that'll work. <laughs> yeah, those characters were the worst. <laughs> Uh, coming around here, Sam. Hi, hello. I am Sam. Uh, Samtastic with three M's. Uh, you can find me on the Twitterverse, which is my hub for all of the things that I do, and or are coming up. TM. I'm not gonna spoil it. Um, but there are things in the works. Um, lots of projects. Uh, what else happens? I'm still reeling. Um. Uh, tw Twitch, I do the stream. Um, <laughs> I, I stream variety games, um, try to keep it gay. My Sims house is real gay. Um, yeah. Oh, right. Uh, Sundays, so tomorrow. Today's Saturday? Yeah, tomorrow, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. I am on the Old Myths here, uh, playing Pyre, the bitchiest grave cleric you'll ever meet. Um, and it's a lot of fun. And yeah. That's awesome. All right. Well, I am Matthew Foreman. I am at Matthew W. Foreman on Twitter. <sighs> I say this like six times a week. <laughs> uh, I am a Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop RPG content creator and designer. Um, today you can find me over at Dice Priori, which is 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 one is the channel that I co own, and I will be designing at uh, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. I will be I, I'm gonna like start finishing up my Path of the Drag Barbarian. I, I'm hoping to finish that by Pride Month. Yeah, so I'll be doing that on Mass the Machine starting at 3 p.m. Um, uh, Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, and uh, you can catch me then at. 6 p.m. Eastern here on Variant Rolls, where I often can be found as well, uh, playing Fisher, the wholesome gay furbog lore bard who is, uh, I'll be playing in Come On In The Water's Gay, which is our, our queer, our, our, which is our Saltmarsh game. So yeah, check me out on Twitter. I'm on Dice Priori running stuff, and I'm on Variant Rolls playing, and, and well, I've at least ran one thing. So oh, that's it. I want to thank you to everyone who donated bits today and to help support Trans Lifeline. I want to thank my wonderful guest who came on and talked, and because this is not an easy thing to do, to come on in, talk about your own life, talk about issues, talk about things that are that hit close to home. Um, I super, super appreciate it. Y'all were just wonderful. Um, but I think that's that covers everything. Check out Follow Variant Rolls on Twitter. Subscribe if you can. Subscribe for free with Twitch Prime if you got it. And uh, 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 we'll see you later at 6 p.m. Eastern for Come On In The Water Square. Bye. Thank you.